Thank you, Fred. Thank you. For, who else has birthdays? Benita. Benita. We almost forgot. Oh, Jerry, you were sleeping. <laughs> Happy birthday to Carol. And, and, <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carol and Benita. Happy birthday to you. How old are you? No, I'm If you have your Bibles, turn to, we're, we're getting close to the end here, but turn to Isaiah 58. I, I, I certainly want to thank all of you who have been encouraging me as we've worked our way through the book of Isaiah for the last year plus. Um, yeah, yes. And uh, a special thank you. Uh, some of you have been um, sending me um, in, in text on Instagram or in emails um, questions or uh, things for me to think about. Um, uh, this week, um, you'll be embarrassed when I met Jerry actually sent me a link to a video um, by two of my favorite teachers, um, Dr. Um, uh, Godfrey and Dr. Uh, Sinclair. Um, Ferguson, thank you, Dottie. Um, so uh, I thank you to all of you. But we are in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. And I'm going to read to you verses 6 through 9, which is sort of the meat of what we'll talk about today. But we will touch on uh, most of the other verses in this, in this chapter as well. Hear then the word of God, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break. It will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. And then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to your word, this is your word. These are not ordinary words that we might read in a newspaper or in a magazine or a periodical or our favorite novel. This is your word to us. So we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would help us in our understanding, that we might be both hearers and doers. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah has been helping us to understand redemption. Sometimes we think of redemption as very personal. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I confess that I'm a sinner and I need to trust God. And we've compartmentalized our understanding of our faith that it's particularly here in America, where it's very personal and it involves me and God and me and Jesus and we walk side by side and God has redeemed me. Isaiah has been helping us to understand that redemption is more than just your personal salvation. That God, when he created the heavens and the earth, created the heavens and the earth so that all of creation might give him glory. And Isaiah has been helping us to understand God has redeemed you so that you might go out into the world and work in the creation so that the creation might once again give him glory. We saw that in chapter 1. We saw that in chapter 9. We saw that in chapter 12. 
And when I opened chapter 58 three weeks ago, that's when I started on chapter 58, a verse in the book of Matthew came to mind. Jesus says these words, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Isaiah has been teaching us that part of our responsibility as redeemed people is to let our light shine before others that they might glorify God who is in heaven. Now, in fi chapter 53, we certainly learn that aspect of redemption that, that we're sinners and God promised Isaiah 700 years before the time of Jesus that he would send a redeemer, Jesus, and that that redeemer, Jesus, would pay the penalty for our sins. But he pays the penalty of our sins so that we might be qualified as sons and daughters of the king to work on his behalf and his name in the creation. And so what the Lord wants now, since we've been redeemed, is that the body of believers, his church, to serve as the model home for the new neighborhood that he has promised to build here in on this earth. We pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth. On earth. As it is in heaven. Jesus taught us that prayer. He wants everyone to be able to look at the body of believers, the church, and catch a glimpse of what the future will look like so that the model that we build here on earth causes those who watch the new neighborhood being built say, I want to be a part of that. God is doing something. I want to be a part of that. So what kind of body of believers can be that persuasive in the broken world that we live in? What kind of body of believers is preparing here on earth a taste of what the new earth will be like when the Lord returns? What kind of body of believers is preparing the way of the Lord? Remember when Jesus, when Jesus was beginning his ministry, born in Bethlehem, his hometown was Nazareth, and he comes back to Nazareth and he goes into the synagogue and he sits down and he is handed the scroll out of the Old Testament. And do you remember what book of the Bible the scroll was from? Isaiah. Jesus is beginning his ministry and the, and the hallmark of his beginning his ministry is the book of Isaiah. That's why it's so important to understand Isaiah. And what does he read? He reads out of chapter 61, which we'll get to. And he says, these are the words of Jesus, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives recovery to the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee. And after he reads that, he sits down, and he says to everyone who was listening to those words, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, all the justice, all the righteousness, all the mercy that Isaiah has been demanding that the people of Israel produce to a watching world, Jesus is now bringing to the world in his own person. Jesus will demonstrate on earth the way it is in heaven. And then he sends us 
He sends us, his body of believers, filled with his spirit into the world to demonstrate on earth the way it is in heaven. So that people say, I want to be a part of that. God is doing something. God is moving. I want to be a part of that. Isaiah's message today is challenging, not because it's hard to understand. I think it's easy to understand, but it's blunt. And it begins by Isaiah in verse 1, calling the people to repentance, exactly what he did in chapter 1. He writes in chapter 58, verse 1, Cry aloud and do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgressions to the house of Jacob, their sin. First verse of chapter 18, he says, Declare to my people, declare to the church, declare to those who say they are believers, declare to them their transgressions. Now, what would you think you would read in verse 2? You might think that Isaiah then begins to delineate how many of the Ten Commandments they broke. Let me read to you verse 2. They seek me daily. They delight to know my ways. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgments of their God. They ask of me righteous judgment. And they delight to draw near to God. Now if I were a believer and I moved to a new town and I was looking for a church that, as verse 2 says, sought God daily, delighted to know his ways, asked God for righteous judgment, and delighted to draw near to him, I might say, that's a church that I want to go to. That's a church that I may want to belong to. But not Isaiah. Look again at verse 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my own. In other words, they're pious, they're religious, they're Bible reading, they're praying folks. They even enjoy being this way. They delight in their religious practices. So my question is, is it possible for a church to do all these good things with no awareness that something is tragically wrong? Because that was the case in Israel. Look at verse 3. The people respond. Why have we fasted? And you see it not. Why have we humbled ourselves? And you take no knowledge of it. The people of God had not only been worshiping God, they'd been fasting. And they afflicted themselves, they humbled themselves. You might say, wow, that's, whew, they're fasting. That's pretty serious Christianity. Aren't they taking their sin seriously? But God is still standing off at a distance, still withholding himself, and they wonder why. But the question why that we read in verse 3 is not an open-hearted why that a child might ask to you, you know, why can't I do this? Why are we doing this? An open-hearted question seeking to understand. Their why is dumping their frustration on God. They thought God was being unfair, and the, therefore they say, why have we fasted? Why have we humbled ourselves? You're being unfair, God. And God answers that their fasting and their self-affliction are religious cover. It 
was a religious cover for finding pleasure in things that were important to them. Look at the last part of verse 3. Behold, in the days of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and you oppress all your workers. You make yourself look low and pious. You make yourself look prayerful. But God says, I see how you conduct business. I see your attitude on Monday. I see your mercilessness, your harshness. I see the way that you oppress others. I see how you deal with people in unmerciful kinds of ways. What poisoned their soul against God was not the sin of murder or thievery. What poisoned their soul against God was their religion. Here's the problem. When we think of our Christianity, when we think of our faith, we think of it piecemeal. We don't connect the dots between fasting and worshiping and our living Monday through Friday. We practice, and I'm probably not the first person to ever use this term, we practice what I call schizophrenic Christianity. Over here on Sunday, I'm praising God. I'm worshiping God. I humble myself before God. Come over here on Monday through Friday, I'm done with my religious life, now I can live my own life the way I want to live. And even though you might not do anything terribly, terribly wrong, this is my life, and I'm going to live it my way. But God, and this is the importance of the scriptures and the book of Isaiah, God doesn't think piecemeal. If our Christianity, however sincere, doesn't move us to make our world a better place, it's unacceptable to the Lord. Unacceptable. Do you remember what we read in chapter 1 when we first began this study? Let me read to you from chapter 1. Verse 13. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Stop bringing your incense. It's detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your feast and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even though you offer many prayers, I am not listening. He's saying this to the people of God. I'm not listening to you. Yeah, you're gathering every Sunday, every Sabbath. You're gathering. You're doing all the things that the law instructed. I'm not paying attention. Why? Look at the last part of verse 15 in chapter 1. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Lest you think this is only in the Old Testament, both Andrew and I have preached through the book of James. Listen to these words from the book of James, chapter 1, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep 
oneself sustain, unstained from the world. The message of James is the same message of Isaiah. Don't live schizophrenic faith. Verse 4 says, Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Exactly what Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15 said. The authenticity This is where Bob Godfrey and I might disagree. The authenticity of your Christian worship on Sunday morning. The authenticity of your worship is shaped by the justice that you practice Monday through Friday. The authenticity of your Christian worship is shaped by the justice that you practice Monday through Friday. Tony Campolo, retired professor at Eastern University, um, a college in central Pennsylvania um, that I had an opportunity to visit and, and visit with Dr. Campolo. And he has a famous he has a famous um, sermon, and I think I've quoted from it. I think Sir, um, Andrew's quoted from it. It's called um, um, Friday's Here, But Sunday's a Coming. And he goes through the pain and suffering of Jesus, and he says, They've nailed my Savior to the cross. It's Friday, but Sunday's a coming. And Satan looks like he's won the day. It's Friday, but Sunday's a coming. I think we need a new sermon with a new title. It's Sunday, but Monday's a coming. We're here, we lift up our voices, we bow our heads, we raise our prayers. What does God think of it? What does God think of it? You'll find out. Because it's Sunday and Monday's a coming. Will the piety that we show as the people of God on Sunday produce a passion for justice, for righteousness, for kindness, for mercy on Monday? That's the question of Isaiah 58. Jonathan Edwards, a New England pastor in the 18th century, one of a number of, of people responsible for the great awakening that took place here in America between 1720 and the 1740s, often referred to as the theologian of revival. I hear people talking about revival all the time these days. They want revival and ri they need revival. But he understood what revival was rooted in. And he wrote these words in January 1732. His text for that day was in Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 11. Write it down, go home and read it. Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 11. And he's, as he's preaching on Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 11, he uses these words. He says, quote, God's people ought especially to abound in deeds of charity. Christian love disposes a person to be public spirited a man of a right spirit is not a man of narrow and private views but is greatly concerned for the good of the community to which he belongs and particularly of the city the town where he resides christianity is deep and personal you do have a relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you've trusted in Him. And having a deep personal relationship is good. But if it stops there, 
then your relationship with Jesus is more like a hobby. When God said to us, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, he wasn't saying you should go to church on Sunday. When people were asking John the Baptist what repentance should look like, because that was a time of revival, it was the glory of the Lord coming down in the person of Jesus. When people asked John how they should repent, he didn't talk about religious things. He didn't say, oh, go home, fast and pray. He didn't say, go to church. He didn't say, read your Bible. What did John say? He said, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors came to John. How should they repent? And he said to them, collect no more than what you are authorized to do. Soldiers came to John, asked them how they should repent. And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations and be content with your wages. That's how you honor God. That's how your worship on Sunday is connected with how you live Monday through Friday. When Zacharias, Zacharias said to Jesus, if I have defrauded anyone, Jesus, of anything, I will restore it fourfold. And what did Jesus reply? Oh, you don't need to do that. <laughs> Jesus said, today salvation has come to your house because today you understand how the worship of me on Sunday is connected with how you live Monday through Friday. The Bible says if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how can God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed in truth. 1 John chapter 3. And then in verses 6 through 7 and 9 through 10, Isaiah tells us what social justice and practical mercy looks like, what it is that pleases God. Listen to these words. I won't read them all. Is not this the fast thy chose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke? Let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? And when you see the naked, to cover them and to not to hide yourself from your own flesh? God cares about the whole world. I'm tired of hearing Christians here in the United States saying, those people over there, they're not my responsibility. God says they are. We are a part of the United States. Yes, we are. And we ought to act as responsible citizens. But more importantly, we're a part of the body of believers that is worldwide. We're a part of the kingdom of God that is around the world. I don't think God is impressed when we say, America first. I don't think he's impressed. That's not the mind of Christ that I read in the Bible. Any understanding of Christianity that ends up reinforcing our natural self-absorption self that I'm the most important thing or we're the most important thing, God asks, Is such the fast that I chose? Isaiah delineates five human needs. Four times in verse 6 and once in verse 9, he hits on the loose the bonds of the wickedness, undo the straps of the yoke of the oppressed, let them go free. 
Take away the yoke from your midst. We're, we're called to find people who are oppressed in our culture and to find ways to set them free. Verse 7, the need for food. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Verse 7 again, to bring the homeless poor into your house? Again, verse 7, is it not the fast I chose when you see the naked to cover them? The need for respect. Take away the pointing of the figure and speaking wickedness, speaking unjustly. Isaiah preaches justice. He preaches how we ought to act with mercy, how we ought to act with compassion, how we ought to act with mercy to all of those around us and beyond. But Jesus preaches it and he displays it. And then he gets on the cross and pays the penalty for our sins and fills us with his Holy Spirit so that we might go out and also display it. And not just on Sunday. What I do on Sunday ought to teach me because I hear the word of God, and it ought to encourage me because I worship with my lips, I sing, so that when I go out, I'm going out in the name of Jesus to be a light unto the world so that men and women might see my good works and glorify my Father who is in heaven. If you give yourself a way to bring justice and mercy in the world instead of just living for your own comforts, then verse 8. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. I am with you. You're not going into this battle alone. I am with you. I walk beside you. I strengthen you. I uphold you. And then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy the desires even in scorched places, and make your bones strong. Think of our son David. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. God is building a new Jerusalem. He's calling us to build new neighborhoods that reflect his glory and his honor, where there's no poverty, there's no misery. That's where God is taking us to. And there will be an eternal city that God brings down from heaven, a new earth and new heaven. But in the meantime, he gives us a task of going out in his name and showing mercy, displaying love today. And then in verse 12, we read this promise, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. The Lord is rebuilding the whole creation according to his plan of redemption. And he intends to do it through you and I. Listen to verse 12. You, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. God wants to make you the heroine, the hero in his story of world redemption. God has a plan to bring redemption to all of creation. He wants you to be a part of that plan. To me, it's amazing that all of this is promised to people whose worship, whose worship, verse 13 and 14, whose worship produces a passion for seeing God's work being done in the creation, to free the oppressed, to feed the hungry, to house the homeless, clothe the naked, Speak kindly. We as Christians, I've said this before, we as Christians, 
are going to write the last chapter of history because our God reigns. We will write the last chapter of human history not because of our own strength, not because of our own weakness, but because of God's grace to us. We read in chapter 12, great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. We read in chapter 9, who will accomplish all of this? The zeal of the Lord, Jehovah, will accomplish this. Not you and I. We're empty vessels to be used by God. But God will use us to be the live model here on earth the way it is when Jesus comes again. This redemption of ourselves as well as the redemption of the creation was in the mind of the angel when the angel came to Mary and announced to Mary that she would give birth to the son and her son would be the redeemer. And the angel said to him, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus has a kingdom and he's calling Christians from around the globe in various cultures of the world to punch holes in the darkness. Establish small signs Small neighborhoods, small signs that speaks, my God reigns. His kingdom is coming. His will will be done. And that kingdom will never end. God's redemption is much bigger than you and I fully understand. But he has a plan to redeem you and the creation. Why wouldn't you follow Jesus? For he shall reign forever and ever because he is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks this morning for your word. We give you thanks, Father. I give you thanks for the book of Isaiah. It helps us to understand, Father, so clearly your love for us and how passionate you are that all of creation brings you glory and how you're making us heroes within the plan of redemption. You want to use us to demonstrate your glory, your honor in a watching world. And so as we go from this hour of worship out into the world, strengthen us. And might we be a people who practice justice and mercy and love in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.